This episode of Untold Stories is underwritten by Edison and Ford Winter Estates Incorporated. In 1927, Thomas Edison, the world-renowned wizard of electricity, became obsessed with a project that would consume him for the last four years of his life, the search for an American source of rubber. Although the inventor was 80 years old, he focused on his new project with the same intensity that produced the light bulb, the phonograph, the movie camera, and hundreds of other inventions. His unrelenting passion for his new project prompted his wife, Mina, to quip. Everything has turned to rubber in the family. We talk rubber, think rubber, dream rubber. Mr. Edison refuses to let us do anything else. The wizard's interest in plants began years before, when he began experimenting with bamboo as a filament for his light bulb. His new winter estate in Fort Myers, safely in the subtropic zone, proved fertile ground for his early botanical research. When he first came in 1885, uh, his plan was to build a laboratory along the river, and he did. That laboratory was the basis for Edison's work here in many areas of botanical research, but especially bamboo. He worked with bamboo in that first laboratory, and in fact, uh, planted bamboo throughout the property. After Edison married his second wife, Mina Miller, in 1886, the inventor began seeing more than just practical potential in plants. When he arrived on his honeymoon with Myra in 1886, the two of them scribbled out a plan. And as time went on, he called this place his jungle. Not the jungle, but his jungle. And Myra referred to it as the Seminole Lodge. The Edison's plan for their winter estate included wide paths for strolling and ample space for flower beds, trees, and a formal lawn. Ever practical, Edison reserved most of the eastern side of the 13-acre property for farming, growing food for his family, and for sale. He did have what he had identified as a truck garden. So that would have been a garden that he planted raspberries and strawberries, had nut trees and citrus trees like lemons and limes, and of course the orange trees certainly some vegetables, and he used that in part to sell via the truck. The nearby Everglades Nursery, founded by James Henry Jr., provided many plants for the estate. I expect a great number of the plants in the original place came from out there because that was about the only place to get plants. And I expect that catalog, uh, he probably bought almost one of everything in it. Edison was interested in anything that was growing and that he could have at his house. Jim Hendry would give him a particular plant that he really thought was something he ought to have on the grounds. Exotic and unusual plants began to transform the grounds of the estate. They would plant the orchids within the trees and he even developed a lane that they called Orchid Lane. The wizard's increasing interest in plants and the world outside of his workshop was undoubtedly inspired in part by the subtropical wilderness surrounding his winter home. He enjoyed excursions into the Everglades with family and friends, including fellow inventor Henry Ford, who bought the house next door to Edison in 1916. Ford introduced Edison to John Burroughs, the famed nature writer, and the friends often went camping together. He was here for relaxation and to get away from the frenetic lifestyle he had in New Jersey. So it had to be more relaxed than it was up there. But he was the type of individual who would wanted to go to work early and work on smaller projects in his lab here. Although Edison took time to enjoy Southwest Florida, he continued to work nearly every day in his small workshop, dubbed the Green Laboratory because of its green paint. 
In his lab, the wizard worked on electric power systems, the phonograph, and other inventions, but he was also interested in rubber, a key component in many of his products. I think part of it goes back to World War I when he uh, was in the business of making phonographs and uh, uh, batteries and other products that were affected by uh, U.S. embargoes against Germany. And so back in the 19 uh, teens, he was advocating American self-sufficiency for strategic and valuable materials. And uh, that's about the time when he met Luther Burbank and he and Ford and Firestone supposedly discussed the topic of rubber at that time in, in the midst of the war. Burbank, the renowned wizard of plants, had successfully created new plant hybrids, including a spineless cactus. Edison was impressed with Burbank's success and perhaps saw the potential of hybridizing plants to produce a reliable domestic source for rubber. Foreign control of rubber was a serious problem for Americans. The post-World War I boom in auto production, led by Henry Ford, spurred an ever-increasing demand for rubber. And by 1923, the United States consumed more than 70% of the world rubber harvest. Eight out of every 10 pounds of rubber went into automobile tires. The affordability of automobiles continues, and so Ford is manufacturing more automobiles, and Harvey Firestone comes into the picture at this time because he, of course, is producing Firestone tires, Ford is using Firestone tires, and they're concerned about the availability and the cost of rubber. Unlike his friends Ford and Firestone, however, Edison wasn't interested in finding a commercially viable source for rubber. Instead, his goal was to ensure that the United States would have an independent rubber supply in case of war. He called it his emergency rubber. When he first started in 1923, he was looking at uh, the American rubber crops that seemed to have the most uh, interest on a national level. He would get so excited about these potential plants and then two or three months later something would go wrong and it didn't have as much potential as he'd hoped. Plants that took too long between planting and harvesting were crossed off his list. Edison told reporters, my experiments are all aimed at finding a plant prolific enough to produce a rubber crop in 18 months in time of war. The press followed Edison's work closely, and hyped headlines and stories declared, Edison in South inventing machinery to revolutionize rubber industry. An editorial in the Fort Myers Tropical News stated, we can look forward to the time when Florida south of the Caloosahatchee can meet the nation's demand for rubber. By 1927, the 80-year-old inventor's passion for his project prompted him to form the Edison Botanic Research Corporation with his friends Ford and Firestone. Edison uh, was the uh, head of the project. Uh, Harvey Firestone contributed uh, $25,000, Henry Ford $25,000, and they built a little wooden replica of their original laboratory here on the east side of the grounds. Edison's original green laboratory was shipped to Henry Ford's new historical museum in Michigan a move the inventor agreed to in exchange for a new lab with more modern equipment for his rubber experiments. The site of the old lab was soon put to another use. Mina decided that she would make a gift to Edison for his birthday of a new little office with a reflecting wand behind it. And if he was too tired to walk across the street to the new big lab, then he could stop here at this smaller office. I don't think he liked the little office that much. I think his, his uh, preference was the, the big lab across the street. The wizard delved into his new project with a youthful zest that belied his age. In 1928 and 29, he was very enthusiastic about it. His letters are full of, of excitement and urgency and, and direct orders to people. In those early days, he really doesn't look like an 80-year-old gardener. He looks like somebody who is committed to research and committed to finding a, a scientific solution to this problem. The inventor's new lab was equipped with everything needed for his project, including a machine shop and a glass blowing station. 
Edison needed glass because, of course, he was in a distilling process here with separating the plant fibers and using solvents. And so he did employ a full-time glass blower. He also had a full-time translator, a linguist, because he was receiving plant specimens and seeds from all over the world. He had a huge international network of helpers, and having the name Thomas Edison probably helped. And so it was never a backyard project. It was a major research endeavor. Edison also organized a team of botanic explorers to hunt for potential plants across the country. The explorers were outfitted with Ford cars and camping equipment, and charged with collecting any plant that produced a milky sap when cut. Actually, Edison knew some of the plants that already had rubber content, like the milkweed plant and the poinsettia. He had collectors collecting plant specimens around the United States. In fact, some of the uh, railroad staff were collecting samples and sending them back here from remote areas. The wizard himself also went on exploration trips. He and Mino traveled to Sanibel and Pine Island and Captiva and up and down McGregor Boulevard and into the middle of the state sometimes. And he would carry with him a ball of rubber in his hand and he would come up to total strangers and say, you guys got any rubber plants around here? Um, and, and ask them to, to help in his search for an American rubber crop. As he started collecting plants for this project, they were coming in from all over the country, and it ended up being 17,000 different species of plants that were tested. In the lab, a small team of chemists and botanists worked with Edison to test the rubber content of each specimen. Plants were prepared for testing in what workers jokingly called the wheeze and sneeze room. They have some leaf stripping machines and leaf drying machines. Some of these were probably hand constructed here, but the idea was to get the plant material into a form where they could begin the chemical testing and to test the percentage of rubber by weight. And so first they would use a solvent to pull off the water soluble materials like starches and vitamins and residues, and then get to the rubber mass that was left. Edison eventually perfected a rubber extraction process that became his 1,090th patent. The process that they used primarily was a two-stage extraction process involving acetone and benzene. And the natural rubber doesn't dissolve readily in acetone. So what they would have done would have been to treat the plant sample first uh, with acetone, and they did it primarily in a, a device like this called a sox lead extractor column, so that you're essentially subtracting things you don't want from the sample. Most of the plants the team tested had little or no rubber. And they run a trial, and there were so many failures, so many plants that had no rubber, that they made a rubber stamp and stenciled the word no rubber, and then they would, on the results page, just stamp no rubber um, so that they wouldn't I have to waste any time handwriting that uh, time after time. Testing thousands of plants took time, and Edison relied on his small team of scientists to process the bulk of the specimens. He certainly didn't do all the laboratory work, but he, he also kept a real hands-on uh, knowledge of what was going on. He was in the laboratory. There's an interesting story that um, he used to take samples that they had separated each day Suppose he had done eight different extractions that day. He would set his desk and actually examine the rubber that was produced that day and check it for elasticity and other properties that he thought were important. In the small lab, the workers enjoyed a special camaraderie with a nearly deaf genius. A state caretaker, Robert Hulgram, recalled. He was always playing practical jokes on everyone in the lab. You could pull one on him if you were good enough. It was his wonderful personality that kept one working for him, to realize that he was working harder than anyone else. Edison maintained a rigorous work schedule, and the wizard confidently told reporters that he would do his bit to see it through, even if I have to work 24 hours a day until it is an accomplished fact. The hardworking inventor spent so much time in his lab that his wife, Mina, gave him a cot for his office. Edison was a great napper. We have photographs of him in his laboratories in New Jersey actually sleeping on the laboratory table. Slept with his shoes on so he'd be ready to go. His assistants frequently brought him nourishment. His favorite food of the time was a warm milk and spinach concoction uh, that uh, he uh, 
he drank, he ate to keep his, uh, to keep his energy up. The inventor, who famously quipped that genius was 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration, used the same scientific approach that proved so successful during his search for a light bulb filament. It's a great example of his empirical uh, trial and error approach to the, to the subject. The, there are hundreds of these notebooks that go through the day-by-day -day trials of testing the plants for rubber, testing the chemical processes of extracting the rubber, and many, many pages are filled with X's and results that failed. And only occasionally does he have a good day when the results prove in the direction that he was hoping for. And on one page he says, hurrah, I found it. The monumental task of cataloging and testing thousands of seeds and plants prompted an assistant to grumble that this rubber business seems to reach out to infinity. To help speed up the process, Edison encouraged an innovative think tank atmosphere in the lab. Edison's theory uh, in, in all of his work was that um, many minds thinking about similar projects sometimes produce uh, great work. And that was certainly true of his whole practice. He used what he called muckers. And the muckers would muck around with projects and look at each other's work. And uh, he would certainly reflect upon their successes. The wizard's quest for the perfect plant continued. And in 1927, he visited renowned Naples botanist, Henry Neerling, who favored ficus as a possible source for rubber. Soon after his visit, Edison planted more than 100 ficus saplings and other rubber-producing trees on his estate. Many of the trees came from his friend James Hendry and the Everglades Nursery. I'm sure these big um, ficus, um, the um, lofty fig as it's called in India, I remember Henry telling me at one time that he had gotten a couple of dozen cuttings from out of the country, rooted cuttings brought in, and he shared them with Edison. And I'm sure that's where those big ones came from because there's some the same age at the courthouse in Fort Myers. Other species of rubber trees were also planted, including a slender sapling that now spans nearly an acre. The banyan tree was planted in 1925. It was one of a number of rubber trees that Edison, Firestone, and Ford all planted on the property at the same time. There was kind of a mixed thought process of whether or not the trees or the shrubs and the vines would produce the most effective source of latex. So we uh, don't have any evidence that the banyan tree was planted with any ceremony. Edison experimented with tapping the trees, searching for a way to reduce the cost of harvesting the sticky sap but eventually gave up the idea of using tropical trees for his emergency rubber. Very early in his work, he decided that tropical plants were not the, uh, the proper plant to pursue for development of latex. And he decided to switch over to plants that could be grown in the United States and required a minimum amount of harvesting time the wizard eventually found more than 1,200 plants with some rubber content. He deemed nearly 600 species as potential candidates for his project. Once that they started finding plants that had some hope, and they, they grew them year-round here, and they continually tried to crossbreed the successful varieties. He had staff who maintained the plots during the summer while he was up north. Hundreds of species of plants, many ignobly known as weeds, were cultivated on site. Research plots surrounded the lab, but the growing scope of the project soon overwhelmed the test gardens. An assistant wrote to the wizard, I'm having the orange grove in back of the barn plowed and made ready for planting. I think we'll require about 25 acres if all seeds are fertile. Edison was convinced that this project had to go quickly and he realized the time was running out in his own life. He would insist for rapid results from his plant collectors and his chemists and his botanists and once said, I do not have a year to wait. The laborious process of growing and testing thousands of plants eventually prompted Edison to jokingly tell reporters that the patience of Job has been considerably overrated. Finally, in 1929, after years of trial and error, Edison found a plant that seemed to hold the promise of success. 
a common weed called goldenrod. The wizard especially favored a variety called Solidago leavenworthii. His chosen plant was a good yielder, and he estimated that it might produce 1,500 pounds of rubber per acre. Edison was jubilant and spent his longest time in Fort Myers that year. He told reporters, I'm feeling quite confident about the outcome of my work. The holy grail of rubber seemed within his reach, and a visitor jokingly wrote in the Seminole Lodge guest book, it was a great joy to meet the new King Midas with the rubber touch and his queen. Perhaps inspired by Luther Burbank's earlier success with hybridization, Edison began cross-pollinating the best rubber-producing varieties of goldenrod and told reporters with a chuckle, I'm trying to take Burbank's place. Edison eventually produced a supersized species that was later named in his honor. The wizard's long quest for rubber had captured the imagination of Americans, and his progress was eagerly followed by the press. This is a golden rod that is 12 feet high. This will give about twice as much rubber per acre as other golden rods I've had. Goldenrod was grown in nearly every garden plot on the eastern side of the estate. In the lab, testing continued, but little rubber was actually produced. They didn't make a whole lot. Um, there's there's uh, pieces like this and a few more in the laboratory. Uh, there was enough to go to Washington and show to the Secretary of Agriculture and to show that, to Eleanor Roosevelt that they had produced actual rubber here. But it wasn't in the, uh, the level of the tons and tons that would be needed to uh, solve any kind of crisis in America. Many Americans supported the development of synthetic rubber, and a popular study noted, it's goggle-eyed optimism to count on the dandelion, milkweed, goldenrod, or any other native plant to relieve our rubber shortage. Yet, Edison believed in the potential of his gangly weed and rejected the idea of synthetic rubber as too impractical and too distant in the future for him to bother with. By 1930, the 83-year-old inventor's health was in decline, and his wife blamed the rubber project and the press for overwhelming him. She told friends, it comes from nerves, as he is not getting rubber results to his satisfaction. A year later, during his last birthday interview with the press in Fort Myers, he admitted he needed another two years to work on the project. It was not to be. The beloved American icon died on October 18, 1931, leaving a nation to mourn, and his last project unfinished. That same year, the DuPont Company announced the successful production of synthetic rubber, and the first tires made of the newly dubbed neoprene were produced by Firestone in 1933. Despite Edison's death and the development of neoprene, the wizard's botanical research continued in Fort Myers. The leaders of the Edison Botanic Research Corporation and, and Ford and Firestone and Mina and her brother had no intention of shutting it down. And at this point, they had some frustrating results and some concern about the yield of rubber. And so instead of shutting the project down, they went out and hired an expert. The test plots of Goldenrod were expanded, but two years later, the rubber project was derailed by the Depression. Eventually, the question came up, how much longer can Ford and Firestone invest their money in it? And so they started looking at alternatives and handing it over to the U.S. government. And so that's eventually what happened. Although the Edison Botanic Research Corporation dissolved in 1936, more than 20,000 of the wizard's research plants were transferred to a government lab in Savannah, Georgia, where they continued to be cultivated until America's next wartime emergency, Pearl Harbor. And those plants were still there in 1942, and the project expanded once again. And there was talk of turning the goldenrod project into an $88 million project with 25,000 employees replacing cotton across much of the South with rubber. But in the long run, petroleum products and byproducts proved to be less expensive and more reliable than, than agricultural products. 
But to this day, you know, whenever the price of petroleum goes up, people start thinking again about the ratio of natural rubber versus synthetic rubber and whether we might be better off with more natural rubber. Edison's rubber research became a nearly forgotten footnote in history. But the inventor turned botanist had successfully planted the seeds of self-sufficiency in America and the now very modern idea of biotechnology, of turning to the soil for solutions. He accomplished his goals and it could have definitely made a difference in America, let alone in, in the industry um, on a larger basis. But with his passing, it's just something that we will really never know. Although the wizard's quest for rubber is now overshadowed by his other monumental achievements, his laboratory and now towering trees remain as memorials to his final project and to the man who electrified the world. To purchase a copy of this and other WGCU produced programs, go to WGCU.org or call 1-888-824-0030. This program was produced for the citizens of Southwest Florida by WGCU Public Media. Show your appreciation for programs like these. Become a member of WGCU, a business supporter, or leave a legacy through a state or planned gift. Call or visit our website at WGCU.org.